Welcome to The Lawyerist Podcast, a series of discussions with entrepreneurs and innovators about building a successful law practice in today's challenging and constantly changing legal market. Lawyerist supports attorneys building client-centered and future-oriented small law firms through community, content, and coaching, both online and through the Lawyerist Lab and Accelerator. And now, here are the co-authors of The Small Firm Roadmap and your podcast hosts. Hi, I'm Laura Briggs. And I'm Stephanie Everett. And this is episode 316 of the Lawyerist Podcast, part of the Legal Talk Network. In today's episode, Laura is talking with newest Lawyerist Lab coach, Ryan McKean, about hiring and firing within your firm. Today's podcast is brought to you by Lex Reception, Cosmolex, Text Expander, Postali, and ESQ Marketing. We wouldn't be able to do this show without their support. Stay tuned. We'll tell you more about them later on. So Stephanie, what's exciting about this episode is that we're able to highlight an alum of Lawyerist Lab, but the news is that he will be coming on to our coaching team. And I think we're all really excited about this. Labsters are excited about it. All of us coaches are excited to have him as part of the team. You'll hear in this episode why Ryan is so strategic and the way that he thinks through things. I mean, I learned so much just from interviewing him about this one topic. I think he brings a lot to the table. So fill us in on what this means for Labsters. Yeah, I mean, obviously super excited to welcome Ryan officially to the team. For those of you who don't know Ryan yet, he has his own firm in Connecticut, which isn't going anywhere. I feel compelled to tell everybody <laughs> like that will still be his primary focus but what we've carved out for him allows him to take a few hours each month and work with our Labsters one-on-one, -on -one, doing our one-on-one -on -one accountability coaching, which is where we just connect with our Labsters each and every month to see, like, how are they doing? Where are they stuck? What's going on? You know, like, you just sometimes need that person in your life that can ask you all those business owner questions and understands. And if you are stuck, what can we do to overcome that? And then create a plan. So that's, that's what our accountability coaching looks like. And so Ryan is going to be helping us by doing some of that coaching. He also just has so much knowledge as you'll hear. I'm sure I haven't heard the interview yet, but I'm excited to hear it because I know he always brings good stuff in how he runs his firm and thinks about his firm. And he does have a contingency fee practice, which honestly is a whole different set of things that you have to be thinking about when you're working that pipeline and how you take cases and value cases. So I'm just really excited to welcome him officially to our team. Yeah, he's accomplished some incredible growth with his firm, but has done it his way. And I think that's a common thread we find with a lot of people inside Lab is that they have a vision. And that's one of the first things that we work on with them is to really set that vision and make sure it's super clear, but then figure out the strategy that's going to get them to that vision. And I think Ryan has just built something that is very intentional and he's very intentional about where he intends for it to go in the next several years. So like you mentioned, his practice isn't going anywhere. So Labsters who are working with Ryan will be able to get his insight and he's still very much in the trenches, so to speak. But I think he has a lot of really good tips and ideas um, that I think will be really helpful. And you mentioned the accountability coaches. That's just one way that you can get coached inside lab. We also have all kinds of meetings and group coaching and focused workshops and other materials and opportunities for you to connect with the other lawyers in lab. So everyone is working towards building and growing their business, whatever that looks like for them. Um, but in addition to the kind of group community aspect of it, I think this accountability coach thing will really help people who just need that, you know, kind of like deadline to work towards. Okay, I'm meeting with my coach again in four weeks. What do I want to have accomplished between then? And somebody like Ryan is super motivating for that. Yeah. And the other thing I'd say is it's always fun for us to highlight and hold out, you know, the successes, the people who get it and who are building their firm differently and putting their clients first and putting their team first, I think. And, you know, even though you guys are touching on some hot topics here about firing people, I think you'll see that Brian even brings, you know, his love of his team to that process. And I, I love that and all the work he's doing 
but that, yeah, what we say, like it works. Yeah, it does work. So I'm definitely excited for everyone to hear this conversation. And it's not just about firing. We talk about how you hire too, how you onboard somebody. And then of course, part of that is when it just isn't working out and how do you figure out, can we salvage this and get this relationship, you know, employee employer relationship back on track, or really is it time to let someone go? And how do you do that professionally and with minimal drama? So now we've got a brief sponsored conversation with Bree from Lex Reception and then my conversation with Ryan. Hey everyone, I'm Zach Glazer, the legal tech advisor here at Lawyerist. And I'm here with Bree Swanson, the director of Lex Reception. Now, Lex Reception, as you can imagine, is a virtual receptionist service for the legal field. And they handle calls in English. They handle calls in Spanish. They they do it 24-7, 365. So, uh, Bree, thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Zach. I'm excited to be here. So... A virtual receptionist service, and I think a lot of our, our listeners have heard of virtual receptionist services, you know, generally, but, you know, it's not just about creating a streamlined client intake, right? It's about managing your client relationships, especially with with Lex Reception specifically, because, you know, a lot of times I think of that initial contact as a race to see who can sign up that potential client. And I think that strikes a lot of attorneys the wrong way. Um, it, it does for me a lot of times. And for lack of a better term, I think it makes them feel, you know, icky, which <laughs> is a scientific legal term. But that's not really what that sort of responsiveness is about. From Lex Reception, it, it's about setting the tone of what your client relationship is going to be, right? Absolutely. And it has to come from a genuine place of finding out where your clients are, where your potential new clients are, what type of platforms they use, where are they hanging out? How do they like to reach out to find an attorney? What type of groups are they in? Um, We see a lot here at Lex Reception, our lawyers reaching out via web chat, also via a web form. So that would be kind of my first tip is to, if you don't already have a web form, like a contact me or an outreach form on your website, you have to have one of those as well as a web chat. Um, before this, Zach, you and I were talking about web chats and how we have kind of some differing opinions on web chat. And right. sometimes people love them, sometimes people don't like them, but being able to have all of the different platforms kind of tuned in so your clients can reach you and your potential clients can reach you. And when I say you, I don't mean like a chat bot that everyone gets annoyed or a voicemail or an automated system that people just frantically hit zero to get to a live person. Anyways, <laughs> I'm talking an actual real first impression that people remember. Right. Because we're, we're talking about, you know, like if we're going to have a, a good client portal in order to make sure that we're dealing with our, our current clients, we want to make sure that we, we show our potential clients that that's how kind of responsive we're going to be. And, and that, that's another thing that you guys talk about is, you know, having that quick responsiveness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think people are pretty, attorneys are pretty savvy when it comes to answering services. We'll answer the call. We'll do the intake on the inbound side of it, but taking that a step further to your point, Zach, of responding quickly, that means when somebody engages you in a web chat or somebody submits their information because they're looking to potentially retain you you're calling them very quickly, Mm -hmm. not after lunch, not after you're, you know, in a brief, like within minutes. Right. And that makes the impression. Um, We do that internally here at Lex. We call them right away. And people are confused sometimes, like when they just hit submit (laughs) and you're calling me, how is this possible? It's 10 o'clock at night it always leads to answering the questions because if they're scouring your site, Mm -hmm. they've got the questions and they don't want to continue to call around to 25 other lawyers and ask the same questions. They want someone to answer their questions right then and there. And if you can't do it or your staff can't do it, that's a great um, reason to reach out to Lex Reception because that's just one of the features that we include in all of our packages is that outbound calling. Right, right, right. And I think certainly that is, um, that's not something that everybody has. It lets people know that you're going to be responsive Mm -hmm. when they become a client. 
which is a, another thing you, you want to make sure once they come in that you're touching base regularly. Right. I mean, that, that's one of the things that you've you've said to me that that is important here. Right. I definitely agree. Touching base regularly, setting up a cadence. So you're whoever's in your kind of funnel, so to speak, they expect to hear from you, whether it's once a week, once a month. I highly recommend getting a CRM. Um, we integrate with hundreds, you know, the, the big ones, um, Clio, Lawmatics, I could go on and on. Anything that basically what has an open API, Lex can do an integration with. That's, again, a, a free service. And we love to have all of the processes and systems kind of talk to each other. So it makes the attorney's life a lot easier to, to automate. Right. Because, the, you know, the whole point is that this is, you know, Lex reception or, or a virtual receptionist is about client relationship management. Mm -hmm. And so it should theoretically connect with your client relationship manager. Right. <laughs> that would be a helpful thing. And yeah, Lex definitely, um, you know, integrates with a lot of those. And, and you guys have a ton of those, um, you know, integrations on your website. I think the fourth thing you have told me is, you know, leaving a good impression with your potential clients. And with your current clients, you know, that that's the whole point of this. Exactly. And just kind of tying back to the beginning, come from a genuine place. You, you had used that really scientific, I think it's a legal term, icky, um, in the beginning. Don't, let's, let's not do that. Let's not be the, the, you know, slimy car salesman, especially attorneys. They're way too savvy for that. They can see through that mm -hmm. potential new clients can. So come from a, a genuine place of wanting to help listening to um, their needs, whether it's with you or your secretary or Lex reception can set up a, a genuine script to kind of get to the heart of the matter. And I mean, a lot of times, again, first impressions are everything, you know, mm -hmm. don't make them the last impression. <laughs> That's exactly right. Exactly right. Well, Brie, thanks for being with us today. It is always nice to have Lex reception on. And if our listeners want to learn more about what you all do, they can just go to www.lexreception.com forward slash lawyerist. And it's my understanding that you guys have um, an email going out to all of our insiders here in a couple days as well. And so they can, you know, find a lot more information there also. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, Zach. It's always super fun to chat with you. Thank you. We'll see you next time, Brie. Hi, I'm Ryan McKean. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Connecticut Trial Firm. In 2020, by law firm 500, named as the 10th fastest growing firm in the country, we focus on handling personal injury cases. And from the business side, we are a growing team of uh, 12 people. That's so awesome. I know that all of us are so excited to have you on the podcast as an alum of Lawyerist Lab. We've loved watching how quickly things have grown for you. So can you start by digging in a little bit? That's a tremendous amount of growth. It seems like you're still on track to continue growing your firm. When did that really start? And what were some of the things that really propelled you towards growth? I think what really started propelling me towards growth was two things, one of which was for a very long time, I was just a solo and it became unbearable. It was just a thing where it's just like, I cannot do this anymore. And I was scared to hire people. I didn't know how, I didn't know how to grow. And so part of it was first looking inward and overcoming that fear. And then it was figuring out how to do it and how to get those pieces in place and taking the actions that one needs to take to actually go from you know being a solo to, to establishing a firm and then growing that firm. And that consists of, you know, understanding the marketing components, the financial components, the people components, the systems all needed to help you grow, support you grow and help you live the life you want to lead and practice in a way that is meaningful to you. Yeah. That's all so important to this entire process. And I think it all begins with that vision, right? So for you, where where did that vision come in that this could be bigger than just me or just me and a small team? Where did you start to feel like there was more you were going to be able to accomplish that you were able to get that motivation to push through some of the hard aspects of what many law firms typically face when trying to grow? It, it was spending an awful lot of time on the vision work and it was spending 
an awful lot of time on the problem that I was having. And the problem that I was having was, you know, the, the stress and anxiety of having to handle all of these things myself. And I'm talking from doing my books to cleaning my office, to answering my phones, to handling cases and, oh, trying to, you know, build systems or market. I mean, all of it was just very hard. And I thought there has to be, you know, some better way to do this. I'm not the first person to try to do this. And so I started looking for resources to help me grow and it sat down and I really did the vision work that was outlined in traction. I did it myself. I did it with my partner and it, it took us days and days and days to sort of map out where it is that we wanted to grow to and what it is we wanted to become. It was not an easy process. Yeah. I think it sometimes feels like it's going to be easy like oh yeah vision let's just let's just get this all down on paper and like cross that kind of assignment or EOS homework off but it can be something where a lot of people really do get tripped up and you brought up another one where a lot of attorneys tend to get tripped up really anybody who works for themselves or is a small business owner some of your early success can feel like it's because you were doing all the things in your business. And then that also becomes the bottleneck or the hindrance to you going to the next level. So you were talking about doing your books and handling all of the marketing. When you are in that position as a small firm lawyer handling too many things at once, how did you make the decision about what you were going to outsource or hire first? One of the things I accepted was and I think it comes from like a point of like self-worth, maybe as a solo or or, or just my, maybe just myself, right? I had to accept that my time was worth money. And what I said to myself was at the minimum, a working hour for me is worth $100. Even though my billable rate at the time, I wasn't doing just personal injury, was probably about two and a half to three times that. I said, at a minimum, every work hour that I have is about 100. It's costing about $100, right? And so what I tried to do is I, I drew that line and I was like, okay, can I get this done cheaper than $100 an hour, whether it's cleaning my office? Yes, I can. So off that goes, can I get my books done for cheaper than $100 an hour? Yes, I can. Because what was happening was if you don't do that, what, what happens is you plot along and at the end of the year on the profit and loss statement, like all those $100 that you've spent doing $15 an hour jobs, they show up, they show up yeah, in lack yeah. of profit. Um, so there's there's an actual cost to them. And I think once I sort of accepted that basic business principle, that's when things really started to change and possibilities really started to open up for me. Yeah, I think the other side of that coin is this idea of, and I've heard this directly from some of our labsters. Well, my accounting doesn't take that much per month. You know, it's only a couple of hours per month. And I'm really worried that whoever steps in isn't going to get up to speed right away, or I have to provide more training than I expected, or maybe it's initially not a win financially. I guess that's particularly true when you're hiring someone like an admin assistant and you have to spend a lot of time training when you first bring them on. How do you get around this idea of feeling like, yes, I could do this and I know I'm losing money by doing it, but I also know that I'm going to do it correctly. And that hesitation over like giving up the control is really what it comes down to. How did you work through those kinds of things? I think ideally you have to accept that there are people out there who can do things that are better than you. My bookkeeper is much better at books than I am. I'm much better at practicing law than he is, but <laughs> both of those things work. And also, I mean, I think initially, yes, when you hire somebody, there's always going to be an onboarding time. But I always think somebody told me this where it was like, can they do the job? 80% can do it. Can they file the mail? 80% is good when they start or within a few days of them starting, right? And I think the answer to that is yes, like you're going to start realizing growth and really quickly because that person who can do it at 80%, soon they're going to do it at 110%. They're going to do it better than you over time as they get their reps in. And so, you know, you just look at it and, and again, this gets back to an, a, a, a vision thing for you, right? Like, do you want to invest in this way? What do you want your day to look like? And if you are happy scanning mail, like, don't give that up. You know, it's your life. It's you, you get one of these, do it. But I think from a business perspective, really, when you sit down and you, and you, you accept, okay, they can do it 80% as well. They're going to get better. And again, I think most of the problems that I've ever had early on with employees was really on me. Like I didn't really teach them. I didn't have things written down as to here's how to do this. And in today's world, it's so easy to 
create training programs and roadmaps and with screenshots and videos and videos of your screen that if you take the time to do those things before you hire and starting with something like mail and phones are are very useful things they're very low hanging fruit in my opinion you're going to start seeing growth faster and faster and faster because what i also think is that there's a mental burden to doing all of these things. Like yeah, not sure. just a time burden, but oh my gosh, I've got a hundred things to do today. I've got to get this motion out. I've got to do this intake. I've got to scan the mail. I've got to clean my office. I've got to do these things. There's emotional load to that. And outsourcing that is going to allow you to unlock bigger and better things for your business. It's so easy to think, right? Like I'm stressed out. I have a lot on my plate. The solution is I just need to hire someone and dump everything onto them, right? And I think what you said about a lot of the times with the early mistakes that are made when you first outsource, whether it's to a contractor or to an employee, it's really on the person doing the hiring. You hired the wrong person or you gave them bad instructions or the communication wasn't great. And a lot of times that's not on them. Now, definitely you can have a bad hire that just from day one, it wasn't what you expected and it's not a good fit. But those instructions and that communication is key because yes, of course you want someone to relieve some of this pressure off of you, but you cannot expect someone else to understand your business in one day or one week. So it's going to take time. I think another pitfall I have seen here is there's no way to measure whether the person is meeting that 80%. So a lot of times I'll see attorneys hire somebody and they're, they have this vague sense that it's not working. But when I ask, oh, like, okay, well, what are this person's KPIs? What is coming in on the weekly report from this person on what they're working on? What are the specific instances where you feel like they're behind? And, and it's usually this gray area of, well, I don't know. It just seems like there's a lot of back and forth, or it seems like my instructions aren't getting through clearly. If there's not a way to measure that, to be able to fairly say, okay, I gave you these six tasks and five of them were turned in late. One of them was not even close to what I needed. That's going to open up your eyes to where you need to give more training or better instructions or whether it's just not a good fit. And I think it's so easy. Like it would be great if we could just snap our fingers and the first person you hire is perfect, does everything well and understands your way of thinking in your business. But that just doesn't happen. It's not reality. Those are all great points. We do a lot of one-on-ones, especially early on. And really the, the, the position I take in doing these and my team takes, even though I don't do them all anymore is, you know, how can we help you? Where are your bottlenecks in your job? And sometimes you find out that it's very simple things. You find out that they're struggling to do the mail because when they scan it this way, uh, this comes up on their monitor and you say, well, the solution to this is an extra monitor, which is going to cost me not very much money. And I'm going to greatly improve my productivity. So when you sort of look at it from things like I'm sitting beside you, I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to understand and you can oftentimes what, what, what our team has experienced are sort of small, but easily overcome obstacles that are in their way and that we have been able to address. And I think from an employer's perspective, just know, or from an employee's perspective, rather, just knowing that they have somebody who cares about them and their job, it makes things a lot easier. Definitely. So you started by outsourcing things like bookkeeping and the cleaning of the office. And that makes sense because those are great, like small things to to dive into. And maybe someone might go, well, that's how much of your time is that really going to relieve? It's that is where you start to get confidence in your outsourcing. And you also relieve that mental load of having to think about it and have it be in the back of your head. Where did you add to your team from there? I'm just sort of curious, like, what did that process look like where you're like, okay, I've got the accounting dealt with and the bookkeeping set up and we've got someone cleaning the office. What's next? What's the next gap that you filled? Reception. We used a virtual receptionist, one of the services, and that was tremendous because, again, it's like I'd sit down to write some brief and my phone would ring and ring and ring and ring. And that became both a practical issue and a mental burden because I'd end my day and I'd have to make 11 phone calls back because I'd have all these voicemails. That became really overwhelming. So phones was the next piece of this to to outsource. Okay. And I would imagine that a common question at this point is you're spending a lot to outsource. I mean, definitely less than what it would cost you to be doing the things or the amount of hours you'd have to put in to catch up on all of those 
phone calls. How did you make that justification? Was it around, okay, when I hit this certain revenue level, that's when I'm going to outsource the next thing, or this person has to save me 10 hours per month for me to feel like it's worth the investment? Did you do any kind of thinking or setting goals around things like that? I looked at that stuff, and every time I've done this, every time we've leveled up in this sort of way, whether it's hiring a a more expensive attorney or adding more staff or whatever it is that we've done, it's always a leap of faith. Like I can look at the numbers all day long and I can say like, okay, but I mean, fundamentally, the thing that has always driven me and perhaps it it shouldn't, perhaps I should be more quantitative about my decision making is just like this thing of like, I can't take this anymore. Like (laughs) my life is going to get better if I do this thing. And and again, I think it's important to understand that things don't have to be forever, especially in today's world where you can have, you know, vendors and virtual assistants and even employees, things don't have to be forever. So if it's not working, like, okay, like you thought you needed a reception service, you thought you could, you were at a growth stage that could afford it. It doesn't seem to be working so well on the balance sheet. Like, okay, time to go back. Um, we've never had to go back when we've done one of these things, but again, it, it, I think it's like you hire when it hurts or that's sort of been my philosophy. Yeah, no, I like that a lot because I think it's really hard to justify it financially because a lot of times the expectations are off. I see this a lot with marketing campaigns too. It's like the first time that an attorney will hire an SEO service. They're like, okay, great. So my website will be ranked in number one within two to three months. And it's like, that's probably not realistic. Like it depends on what you're putting into it. And the same goes with hiring people. You have to take that leap of faith and there will eventually, if you've hired the right person and you're doing the right things as the leader, be a time when you're starting to see those things truly coming off your plate and really being able to see that this person is capable of handling quite a bit and relieving the pressure off of you. So I know there were some times where maybe hiring didn't work out. So we're going to pause to take a quick break from our sponsors. And when we come back, we're going to dive into the other side of this, which is firing. Today's challenging and fluctuating business climate requires law firms to be flexible in the way they run their practice. Whether you're working remotely, in the office, or a combination of the two, you need to be able to work effectively and efficiently on the go at any time. That's why Cosmolex offers a cloud-based total law practice management system with built-in compliance for trust and general legal accounting. With Cosmolex, you get everything you need to run your practice in one solution with 24-7 mobile access that's both secure and easy to use. You'll be able to stay on top of all your billable activities no matter where you are, and your clients will love the direct and secure communication in the client portal. The Cosmolex migration team will ensure all your data is moved into your new system safely and securely so your firm can be up and running in no time. To learn more about Cosmolex Total Law Practice Management System, visit cosmolex.com forward slash lawyerist. Support for today's episode comes from Text Expander. Get ahead of your productivity for the new year with easy to use cross platform snippets. Text Expander makes quick work of mundane, repetitive tasks so you can focus on what matters most. Say goodbye to needless text entry, spelling and grammar errors, and inconsistency in your messaging. When you use Text Expander, you can say the same thing, the right thing, in just a few keystrokes. Text Expander can be used in any platform, any app, anywhere you type. These versatile snippets are better than copy and paste, and they're better than scripts and templates. They work across devices and platforms to allow you to maximize your efficiency while still customizing and personalizing your messages. So take your time back in the new year and increase your productivity with Text Expander. Show listeners get 20% off their first year. Just visit textexpander.com forward slash podcast to learn more. Support for today's episode comes from Postali, a full-service legal marketing agency for law firms. The attorney-client relationship is the cornerstone of the legal profession. Just like you put the client's needs first, you deserve a marketing agency that does the same to grow your practice. Postali works with law firms nationwide and is the only full-service legal marketing agency that can call itself a marketing fiduciary. That's because, at Postali, the impressive results they achieve come from always putting your law firm's financial interests above their own. Imagine a relationship with a legal marketing agency that treats your investment as they would their own dollars, without hollow SEO promises, 
no commission-based upselling, and who won't work with your competitors. Postali is the marketing agency for legal professionals looking for 100% transparency and genuine guidance from a real marketing partner. To learn more about the benefits of working with a marketing fiduciary, visit postali.com forward slash lawyerist. Contact them for a free consult and mention this podcast. Support for today's episode comes from ESQ Marketing, an agency that believes in affordable and reliable marketing for solo practitioners and small law firms. With ESQ Marketing, you'll work with experts in legal marketing. All of their intense focus is on helping attorneys generate more clients and cases from the internet. They don't work with anyone else. You'll breathe easy with low-risk, month-to-month contracts, and there are no long-term commitments. ESQ Marketing earns the right to work for your firm each and every month. Best of all, you'll get direct access to the person working on your account. No account managers to deal with and no lost in translation with your requests. To see if you're a fit, visit esq.marketing forward slash lawyerist to get started. Okay, we are back. So I definitely want your insight on this topic of firing. I've seen you help other labsters with it at LabCon events. I know it's something that I feel like you and I have a pretty good sense. We're on the same page with this. Like when someone just isn't working out, you really do have to let it go and not feel sentimental about it. Can you tell me a little bit about your perspective on when do you try to work with someone versus when is it just time to say, I've got to let them go? We always try to work with someone. Yeah. The whole exception to this is like, if I see somebody who's being disrespectful or violating our culture or toxic, like that is made clear to them on hiring. Like that is a one offense and you're gone. Like that, that will not be tolerated. Disrespect of others on our team will never be tolerated. Yeah. Most of the time you're going to hire people who are going to be or should be good at not doing that, right? So we've we've only had that one time, but I think every other time it's a process. We always try to work with somebody like immensely. We talk about, you know, where they're struggling, what resources could they use, what could we change, how could we help, you know, and so it's 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 an ongoing collaboration. We want to make sure that Anybody we hire has the tools that they need to do their job. And that includes technical tools, whether it's computers or phones. It includes, you know, access to legal research. It includes training. It includes support. We need people to have the tools to their job. So it's an ongoing conversation. There are clear expectations that are made to them through things like KPIs, through things like goals. There's constant feedback given, and not in a way. I mean, I, I we have our feedback system is stolen from like Brene Brown, where it's like, we're going to sit beside you. We're not sitting across from you. We're sitting alongside you trying to help. And that makes things great because there's constant ongoing feedback, right? And we do more formal feedback as well, where it's like, hey, like, this is something that's a repeated problem. We're seeing it. And like, this can't happen. Like, we can't do this. We're in a business to serve our clients. So when somebody is fired, to me, it should never come as a surprise for when it is performance related ever to the employee. Yeah. You can't jump to that right away. I think because there may be things that you don't know about their situation or how they're perceiving the workplace and the flow of everything. It's also, you don't know where your own gaps are. So you don't know, was this an issue where you had three projects back to back where you were really stressed out and you didn't give them the best instructions or you didn't give them a firm deadline. So always give the chance first. Do you ever feel like there's a situation where someone can do the job, but the personality is just not a match? I'm curious if that figures into both your hiring and your firing decisions. Are you looking for people with a specific personality beyond that they meet the culture and are on board with the vision of your law firm and things like that? Is there just where, if at all, does personality fit into that? We personality test upon hiring. And I know there are a number of testing services out there that people like. For us, a simple Myers-Briggs free online test tells us a lot about the person because, you know, we found that different personality types, like if I have a receptionist and they have an I, an introvert in their personality, like they can handle it, but it's going to drain their energy immensely. So when I'm looking for intake, for example, I'm looking for somebody who has an F in their personality profile, somebody who's very empathic, Um, who can connect with a client who's just suffered some tragedy. For, you know, lawyers, I'm looking for J's in their personality, people who are very, like, 
rule-based, get it done kind of people in their personality. <laughs> so I think that those things are are very important to figure out because to me, it's like you can have great people, but they need to, the whole role needs to be a fit for them and a fit for you. And again, I, I always say this, I'm like five, six. If you asked me to play power forward in the NBA, like it's not going to work. <laughs> no matter how hard I practice, no matter, you know, you could give me Phil Jackson and Michael Jordan as my coaches. It's just not going to happen. And I think that in law firms, the same is true. Yeah, very true. I think that the personality is easy to overlook when you feel like you've got someone who is capable of doing the skills or has a good track record or comes with good references. But sometimes that can be the thing that drives you crazy. Stephanie and I were just talking yesterday, recording an intro for the podcast about how aligned you need to be with your law firm partner. And this idea came up as well. She's like, it's not just the big things, like are we on board with the same vision, but it can be the little things about the way that they approach things. And I think personality can be problematic for people. And, you know, you want them to be in the right seats. You want them to be in the job that allows them to thrive and succeed as well, not trying to force themselves into a particular box to make that work. So when you've done your best to try to make things work and it just isn't happening, do you have any tips around how to handle a firing? Like, how do you approach this? Are there best practices of just like, should you remain calm? Do you need to, you know, have a meeting with somebody else there? I'm just sort of curious. It, it sounds like your firm has obviously gone through such massive growth. I'm sure there have been some team members that just didn't work out for one way or another. Yes. And it's, it's a very hard thing, especially because I'm a giant softy. <laughs> That's something I've like worked on. Right. But, um, First of all, I had a business owner tell me when I was first starting out, he says, you know, the best time to fire someone is the first time you think of it. And at first I thought like, that's really cruel and blunt. But over time, I've come to accept that that is in fact great advice because every single time that we have dawdled on like, well, you know, I think we should fire this person and it's cost us so much. And it's usually things you find out after they've left where you're like, wait a minute, this was undone. Or they were causing these problems that we didn't know about with other team members. I think that that's true. So when you're feeling that and you're reaching that and you've done the things, you've tried to support them, you've given them reviews, you've done all these things, right? Then the best thing you can do is sort of quickly move on. Because the more time you spend like, should I, shouldn't I, when's a good time? Should I do it on a Friday? Should I wait till a Monday? <laughs> you know? So sort of narrow the gap because it's unpleasant. Like there's no two ways about it. And what we always think about is like, how can we help ease the transition for them yeah. in any sort of way? Because we've hired them. We may even like them. We may care about them. And so we've had times where we've lined up jobs for other people on their way out. We've had times where we've known people are going through things and we've paid a generous severance where in fact, we looked at it and we said, look, we're probably going to dawdle on this for at least a month or so. We're not getting very much production from this person. Let's pay them a month of severance. Like yeah. in sort of making those decisions, because understand that there's sort of, you know, going away money. Uh, there's a cost to this. So and we always think about, like, you know, how can we, you know, help them sort of save face internally as well and control the messaging around their departure um, so that's a conversation. But generally speaking, the conversations are, we have a script to this. And the script is um, very quickly, you asked if I have somebody else. And the answer is, yes, I do. Um, <laughs> and we will also consult with an employment lawyer. But we always have somebody else. And the firing is done in a, in a way that is protective of the person. We don't want to blow them up. We don't want to embarrass them in any which way. During the pandemic, we've done it on the phone. But generally speaking, we, we're going to do it in a way where um, we had we had one person who we asked our, our staff not to come in early that day. We said, hey, could you come in at 10 instead of nine? Yeah, yeah. So the person had some time to like save face and the conversation is, is very quick. It's, you know, look, we've made the decision to move on uh, from you. You know, our decision is final. And if you'd like to talk about it more, you know, we'll be available a few days from now. And thank you. And that's it. Very quick, very to the point. And again, discussions on how you can help them, what you can do, because again, they're going to be concerned about those things. You know, we tell them like, look, we're not going to contest your unemployment. You know, we're paying you a severance. We have this other opportunity that we think you might be a good fit for. We're grateful for your time. 
you know, and, and again, we, we also make it a point internally to actually practice what we preach. Like we don't bad mouth people who have left. Right. So anybody who leaves my firm, who's seen somebody leave, they know like, it's not like, let's trash this employee. It's like, there's always a post that goes out that says, hey, we're grateful for the contributions that this person has brought. It's not working out. And we we wish them well. And we know that some of you, you know, have friendships with this person and we like this person too, but it's not working out because we found when we've, we've put off those decisions, what happens is it puts a lot of burden on your other people. Like whatever you think is going on is probably worse than you're going to find out that it's actually worse than you, you are aware of. So firing will often come as a relief to other members of our team, or so we have found. I love the way that you put that. I mean, you've thought not just about the moment of the firing, but you've thought about how are we going to handle the actual physical act of doing it? If it's in the office, do we need to have other people present to kind of back you up on the statements that you're making? But also, should we remove other employees from the office during that time? You know, you stated that the decision is final, so it's not opening the door by saying something that is like, I don't think this is working out. That kind of cracks the door open for the person to try to make a case for themselves or something like that. And you've also thought about, let's address some of their biggest fears in that moment. We're not going to contest their unemployment. We've thought about it. And are there other people or jobs in our network where we could potentially refer them to? And you've handled the messaging really well from the top down of saying, we're grateful for this person's contributions. Even if it didn't work out forever, that's okay. And, you know, it kind of says to everyone else, like, this is not going to be a gossip thing. This is not going to be where we badmouth that person. And we talk about what a disaster these different things that they did were. It kind of like handles all of the closure related activities tied up very nicely and neatly and also removes the awkwardness of it too, for the person who is being let go. Cause there's not, I'd imagine there's not really much point in dragging that conversation out. (laughs) And we learned this the hard way. We had this conversation and like, we were like, Hey, we're parting ways with you. Like, this, this, <laughs> like what happened? Not good. We're, we're moving on. And it turned out to be like an hour long conversation where my partner and I couldn't leave the conference room. And it was one of the most awkward conversations ever. And I would advise people never to get involved with it because there is nothing good that can come from it. And also too, if you're doing it, prepare yourself for, you may feel regret after you do it. You may wonder, did I do the right thing? Did I do enough? And understand that you as an owner, like that's part of it. You're generally not gonna wanna hurt people. You're certainly not gonna wanna hurt your organization. And understand that you may feel that moment of like, I know maybe I shouldn't have or, ugh. Yeah. And accept that that's sort of part of your process as well. Yeah, there is going to be a process on your side. You may be thinking about, okay, this this isn't working out. This is causing team friction even. And so once this person is gone, it's going to be good. And that's going to be the weight off my shoulders. And, and that chapter is closed. But there definitely is going to be some processing that you do on the other end of it as well. So we've covered so many awesome tips, but I suspect you may have a few more. So to close things out, you've grown your firm so much in the last couple of years. Are there like one or two takeaways that you're like, man, I wish I knew this lesson. Or if I could talk to an attorney who was poised to do the kind of things that I've done with my firm, I'd really want them to know this. I think the thing that was hardest for me, and I think it's hardest for most people I talk to, is making that leap of faith to hire people to get help. What I saw was, oh my gosh, this is this expense. I'm barely making much money now. How am I going to, you know, spend four hundred more dollars on a reception service a month yeah. or something like that? Like that's real money to me. And when you take those leaps, what you have to understand is you're not just reducing your bottom line, which is the way I think I was looking at it. It's like if you're doing it remotely right you are adding to your top line. And that's the part you don't see when you take that leap. Yeah, that's really important. Well, we're so excited to have watched all of the incredible things you've been doing with your firm. Now members of Lawyerist Lab are going to be able to get coaching from you if they find that to be helpful. And I imagine, I I mean, I hope it doesn't become so overbooked and filled up quickly because you have so much great advice to share, but we're really excited to be able to 
connect people with someone who is really doing the thing, actively doing the thing. I know it's a passion of yours to be able to help people. This is something that you've been doing for years, kind of helping other lawyers along the path. So any kind of thoughts about that as you step into this newish role? This is coming so full circle for me. And when I first started, the only podcast I listened to or the only thing that I read was lawyerist. It was all Sam out there in Minnesota, yeah. like in 2012, right? So I, I, I go on and I actually present on a panel with Sam, uh, I guess almost a year and a half ago now, meet Sam, join Lawyerist Lab. And I think to myself, I'm like, this is exactly the thing that I wish I had earlier in my practice. If I had this thing, it would have accelerated my growth, saved me so much money and time and general energy I wish I had this. And I'm so impressed with the team at Lawyers, the product, the growth, the resources that are offered. I'm just so thrilled to be able to contribute in any which way that I can. Well, we're definitely glad to have you kind of in a more formal way, working on the team with us while you're also continuing to grow your firm and doing all of the great things you're doing over there. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It was great to be able to talk to you about these topics, some of which are awkward and you handled so well. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Laura. The Lawyerist Podcast is produced by Bailey Tiller and edited by Christopher Eng. Are you ready to implement the ideas we discuss here into your practice? Wondering what to do next? Here are your first two steps. First, if you haven't read the Small Firm Roadmap yet, grab the first chapter for free at lawyerist.com book. Looking for help beyond the book? Let's chat about whether our coaching communities are right for you. Head to lawyerist.com slash community slash lab to schedule a 15-minute call with our community manager. The views expressed by their participants are their own and not endorsed by the Legal Talk Network. Nothing said in this podcast is legal advice for you.